Hello, everyone, and welcome. We are so excited that so many of you could join us today for Healing America's Racial Karma. I'm Alex Elliott, the Senior Manager of Events and Engagement for the Public Programs Department of California Institute of Integral Studies, a nonprofit university in San Francisco. Now, let me first introduce our presenters, Alka Aurora and Larry Ward, and then we will get right to the conversation. Alka Aurora is Associate Professor of Women's Spirituality at CIIS. She uses what she calls an integral feminist pedagogy in her teaching, inviting students to see social justice work as a form of sacred praxis. While raised Hindu, Alka developed an interest in Buddhism while in graduate school and spent many years engaged in Dharma teachings and insight meditation. The tradition of engaged Buddhism, particularly as articulated by Thich Nhat Hanh, has significantly influenced her approach to feminism and social justice. Alka's current work is focused on envisioning a fourth wave of feminism that integrates spiritual wisdom, eco-social activism, racial justice, and gender reconciliation. Larry Ward is a senior Dharma teacher in the in Thich Nhat Hanh, Hanh Plum Village tradition. <laughs> Dr. Ward brings 25 years of international experience in organizational change and local community renewal to his work as director of the Lotus Institute and as an advisor to the Executive Mind Leadership Institute at the Drucker School of Management. And now it's my pleasure to turn it over to Alka and Larry. Thank you, Alex. Dr. Ward, it's such a pleasure to be able to speak with you this evening. And I so enjoyed reading your book and got so many new insights from it. And I wanted to start off our conversation this evening by asking you to speak a little bit more about the book's provocative title, America's Racial Karma. Now, particularly this term karma has become is an Eastern term that's found its way into the US and is used all the time. People use it every day. I was on Reddit the other day and I got something called karma points. Um, and so I think that you know many Americans have um, either a distorted idea of what karma represents or maybe just an unclear idea. So I was wondering if you could start us off by speaking a little bit more to the concept of karma generally and then what you mean specifically by racial karma. Okay, well, well, thank you, Alka. Delighted to be with you this evening. Um, yes, karma uh, is a word that's showing up in all kinds of context. Uh, I was buying dog food the other day, and I noticed there's a karma, <laughs> there's a karma dog food, <laughs> and or a karma bar, or a karma this, karma that. So that's the commercialization of everything that's part of our modern existence. For me, I understand that karma comes from the ancient teachings of Hinduism. And what changed for me in understanding Buddhist approach to karma and my own work and study uh, with, the, with karma, what I mean by karma is that our thinking, our act, our, our speech, and our physical behaviors creates energy, the energy of action, which is the Sanskrit definition of karma, just one word, action. And so the reason I chose this title is because our actions have created our racial condition, hmm. have created our racialized consciousness. And those actions of thinking and language and behavior continue to carry the energy and momentum of that action forward. Hmm. Thank you. So that's why I use that, that term. And the other part of that term uh, indicates from the perspective of samsara or the endless round of birth and death or our experience of dissatisfaction reoccurring in our lives uh, is a normal human experience, but I'm looking at karma from a historical perspective of how actions of thought about race, the language about race and the behaviors over the last 500 years uh, around race have created the circumstances we have now. Hmm. 
So what I understand from what you're saying and also from reading the book is that we shouldn't think of karma as just an individual thing, right? Like, but it's actually collective. Yes, it, it is collective because everything is inescapably collective in spite of our mm -hmm. modern worship of individualism. Mm -hmm. um, and that actions, the energy of the actions continue. Mm -hmm. So for example, I didn't put this part in the book because it's a, a short book, but you know, the, the thinking and the language and the behaviors uh, exemplified by Hitler are still alive in people, mm -hmm. even though Hitler's gone. So mm -hmm. when I'm trying to help myself and all of us understand is how we think about race, the language we use about one another, and the behaviors we use as we interact with one another either heals us or creates more suffering. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about like, so for instance, you know, the energy of Hitler still lives in human consciousness in some ways mm -hmm. today. So oftentimes, you know, when I teach or I'm in conversations where people are talking about structural racism or institutionalized mm -hmm. racism, you know, sometimes white folks will say, but I didn't do it. I never, you know, lynched anybody. I never, you know, I believe all people are equal. Hmm. Is that, are they, is that person still implicated karmically in racism? Of course, of course, because karmas created our circumstance and that circumstance hmm. is shared, whether we want to have be shared or not. It's like being on a ship hmm. that starts to have engine trouble mm -hmm. and it doesn't matter when that happens if you're on the first deck or the bottom <laughs> because <laughs> we have a shared contradiction. Got it. So I think what I'm getting and also from reading your book is that we can't opt out. We can't say, I, I don't want to be part of this. Um, no, no, we can't because our history is grounded in the lives and blood and sweat and tears and genius and talent of our ancestors. Mm. It is mm -hmm. not an abstraction. And so karma also, from a neurological perspective, um, conditions our nervous system mm -hmm. to behave, to think, to react in certain ways. So even if I wasn't a slave and I wasn't, the energy of that experience still lives in my body. Mm -hmm transmitted to me by my ancestors, whether I want it to have it transmitted to me or not. Wow. So karma still lives in our nervous system. I'm going to be pondering that for a while and I'm going to come back to that. Okay. But I want to um, actually want to step back a moment and ask you to speak a little bit more about your own personal history. Um, okay. In your book, you talk about growing up in Ohio in the 1950s. Mm. Um, what, and you have experienced some, not just, you know, institutional racism, but overt acts of racial hatred. Um, so if you could speak a little bit about your own experience and how did it lead you to the Dharma? Hmm. Well, I, I've spent a long life in religious studies and spiritual practice, even before my 30 years or so with Thich Nhat Hanh. Hmm. So I'm also an ordained Christian minister. I've taught and studied theology um, to priests and lay people around the world. Cleveland, uh, in the 50s, most African-American communities were in a pocket, uh, in a circumscribed geophysical environment. And in that environment, that I grew up in, um, I played, I felt safe, I had fun, I had great neighbors. Mm -hmm. And, um, but we were always aware that it was dangerous to step outside the pocket. Mm -hmm. um, most of the people, most of the family members I grew up with and neighbors were uh, worked in uh, factories, uh, you know, aluminum factories, car factories, and those were 
you know, adequate paying jobs, so to speak, for that time period. So we were able to, with all of our help, uh, you know, to get to get a house, to get a tiny little house and to care for it. I think the first time I really realized how dangerous racialized consciousness was when I got when I was shot at by a policeman for playing baseball in the wrong place. And fortunately, this person missed, but they put a hole in the hat I had on, which my mother used to keep <laughs> by, by, the, by on top of the refrigerator. And every time I'd leave the house, just don't forget that hat. So be careful, be safe, mm -hmm. and be wise. And so as then as the 60s happened, Black nationalism happened, all that was going on in Cleveland. Martin Luther King came to my high school a year after I graduated to give a talk, et cetera. So it was the, the ferment of civil rights was going on and began to really grow throughout Cleveland. And then we had riots uh, mm -hmm. in 1966. And then again, riots again in 68 after Martin's murder and assassination. Um, so, you know, my, the way I like to say it is, I don't have a choice about doing this work. Mm. Mm -hmm. My body and my skin has required I do this work mm -hmm. in order to stay sane, in order to be kind to myself uh, and to others. So Cleveland was a great teaching uh, for me um, in terms of recognizing people's pain, people's suffering, uh, it was the first time I really encountered groups of African Americans acknowledging the pain, mm. acknowledging the suffering, and coming into voice. Mm. Mm -hmm. And I read that you were only 11 when you were shot at, by the police officer, is that yeah. correct? Uh -huh. Wow. And it just makes me think how early those, um, particularly, I think, Black boys are, are um, cast in this role as, you know, the stereotype or the racist concepts like thug or potential, uh, someone who's potentially going to commit a violent act. And you have to, you know, the police industrial complex kind of just comes in and starts that policing. And like you're, you said, your mother told you to take that cap because it's like she, she had to tell you that this world is not safe. Yeah, and, and to be honest, you know, there were uh, normal socioeconomic challenges in my neighborhood, as there were uh, in most inner city neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the time I felt safe, mm. unless I saw a police car. Mm. Mm. Right. I was not robbed or mugged or threatened by anybody in my neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and I mean, literally, I right. wasn't, there was only one person I had a fight with, they picked on my sister, which was a bad idea. So, <laughs> um, but other than that, there was kind of a cocoon of mm -hmm. naivete, we're okay, we're making it, we're improving. And then when the riots happened, the neighborhood I was in was also multicultural. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, neighbors from Poland, from Italy from around the Europe and immigrants who had come after World War II. And, um, but when the riots first happened, every, everyone who could left mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to go live other places where they felt safer. Mm -hmm. So that's where you start seeing more, uh, a different type of division happening between different yes. ethnic groups of ethnic immigrants. Yes. Right. And so, um, how, again, I want to return to this question of how did you come to the Dharma? Because you were a Christian first. Is that? Yes. But I, re all religion for me is a spiritual practice. I, I don't, I don't try to focus on belief systems. Mm. Mm -hmm. As my experience and observation is belief systems can be really dangerous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so uh, I try to focus on my actual human experience mm. and uh, my spiritual practice which is what i really appreciate about buddhism even though 
there are traditions of spiritual practice similar to Buddhism and Christianity, but those traditions didn't get transmitted very well. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, huge contemplative traditions, mystic traditions, with similar practices to some of the Buddhist practices, but most Christians don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so that is something, uh, a rich part of Christianity that has been missed. Mm-hmm. And so I always, and Thich Nhat Hanh, and I encourage people, do not lose your roots, whatever they mm-hmm. are. Mm-hmm. Use the practice of mindfulness and meditation to open up your roots. Mm. So you can see their genuine uh, and lasting value. Yeah. I think Thich Nhat Hanh even wrote a book about something like living Jesus, living, living Buddha, living Christ. Living Christ. <laughs> right. Recognizing yeah. that there is that shared mysticism and sense of contemplation. Yeah. You know, I'm really reflecting on this concept that you shared about feeling safe within the cocoon. And then recognizing that outside of that, there was not safety. And um, having been a part of various spiritual communi- communities in my life, I think many people would like to think that um, Buddhist communities um, can be a sort of cocoon where folks don't have to think about racism or sexism or all of these isms. Um, but I think that the reality of it is that oftentimes, well, not oftentimes, that these communities are also enmeshed in the same systems as the general community. So I wonder if you could speak to, like, is racism a problem within Buddhist communities? Well, I, I think, um, well, part of it depends on what you mean by racism. So I, one of the things I, I've noticed is in America, especially how we merge language. Mm. So racism is systemic. It's mm-hmm. about power. Mm-hmm. And then there's attitude, mm-hmm. which is more individual, uh, prejudice, stereotyping, all of which is part of the whole system. But yes, Buddhist communities can escape like no other community can escape. Mm. Mm-hmm. So it would be, and for me, it's... Um, I gave a short talk recently on uh, Black Lives Matter as a door to liberation, and it upset some Buddhist people, <laughs> um, which is fine, but it's, I, it struck me, how could they be upset when one of the deepest teachings in Buddhism is about signlessness and mm-hmm. how we get confused, and even a quote from the Buddha, Buddha where you see a sign, you see deception. And for me, we've, we've made race signs of ourselves mm. where we reify essences in ourselves based on our skin tones that don't exist. Mm-hmm. Like women are like this. Well, that doesn't make any sense. Black men are like this. White people, I mean... We have got to learn how to let go of our conditioning. Mm -hmm. And and I know it can be a complicated term, but this reification of uh, essence where there is no essence. Hmm. And so so I I think that's under, this is why Buddhist psychology is so important to me, because this is a part of what we have to unpack Mm -hmm. and release. So if I understand correctly, to reify something means to make something that's not real appear real. Yeah, so it's to place values on something, Mm -hmm. to project values on something that aren't inherently there. Right, just like social science has demonstrated that race is not real, right? So it's this like elaborate fiction, right? That we can't ignore because it has really it has real effects it has profound right. consequences yes and so returning to this kind of experience that you had about talking about black lives matter in a buddhist community i've been a part of buddhist communities and other spiritual communities too where is that's pushed back because they're saying well just by talking about it you're creating divisiveness or making it real <laughs> Right? Have you heard that? <laughs> yes, uh, I, I just started laughing because 
um, the first noble truth in the Buddhist tradition and the teachings is about suffering. Mm. Uh, and for me to pretend there is no suffering connected to racialized consciousness is to live in an illusion. Mm. So part mm -hmm. of the part of the dilemma for Buddhist communities, and I've studied, I continue to study Buddhist history, is the tradition of Buddhism has a tendency to stay safe in the power structure that exists. Mm -hmm. And this is true all the way back if you go to look at Buddhism in China and, and other parts of the world. So there's this tendency not to upset the powers that be. Mm -hmm. Now, there are parts of Buddhism in history where that that tune didn't play well <laughs> and people got really active. And Thich Nhat Hanh is a great example of what it means to take the practice of mindfulness, the practice of shamanta, calming down, the practice of vipassana, seeing and deep looking into our social fabric. Mm -hmm. So for me, meditation isn't just something for my mind. It's to practice insight. What if we practice insight meditation and turned our attention to our school system? Mm. What if we practice insight, gaining insight, gaining wisdom into how we communicate with one another? Mm -hmm. So for me, the practices of Buddhism are not separate from how I live in the real world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because there isn't some other world. Right. So this brings me to this sort of idea, um, and, and this might be different in the, like the Theravadan versus the Zen tradition um, that I've also heard is that, you know, our focus needs to be on our own individual liberation because samsara is samsara, right? This, this world of suffering is, it is what it is. Um, the best that we can do is try to valiantly seek our own liberation and perhaps other help others with their liberation on a, uh, in a spiritual way, um, yes. but leaving the social out of it. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of Thich Nhat Hanh's work and your work is that it's saying, no, they're actually, we have a role to play in this world, uh, in these systems of oppression. Well, one of the reasons we do is because our systems and the world is inside of us. Mm -hmm. It is not simply outside of us. And ah. so to to describe samsara as if it was external samsara is first internal mm -hmm. it is mm -hmm. my, my is my own internal dissatisfaction with being a human being mm -hmm. and that gets manifested in our social interactions our social thinking our social psychology and so society lives in us mm -hmm. it doesn't just live outside of us and it's the same issue with the earth. We think nature is out there. Right. It's not. We are nature. Yeah. Uh, okay. Becoming conscious. And so I, uh, another way I'm starting to describe this is the, the liberation of my heart and mind as an individual, for me, is a stepping stone to the next liberation. Mm-hmm. So it is not enough. Actually, I gave a talk last year about being calm is not enough. Mm -hmm. Being satisfied with your own feeling of wellness and peace is fundamental to our healing and transformation. But that's the first step, not the last step. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, for me, we, 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 we're at a point of understanding liberation beyond the personal. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that for me is the shift between the old story of liberation and the emerging new story of liberation, though they're deeply connected. Yeah. Wow. So something has just really been, things are really clicking for me as I'm hearing you speak. First of all, this, this concept of the first noble truth of the suffering in life, right? Mm -hmm. It's like we have to recognize that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So it's like the first noble truth is also that um, 
that racism is tr is yeah. alive and well exactly. and is a major cause of suffering. Yes, right? and there are causes. Name it, yeah, unless we can name it, how could we right. ever seek to transcend it? Right. Right. Or to heal from it. Yeah. Um, and that this idea that samsara is within us. So in order to actually, we can't, it's, there is no individual liberation out if we can't undo the way these systems live in, with, within us. I really started to understand this a long time ago uh, when I was doing undergraduate work. I got a degree in psychology and another one in organizational behavior at the same time. Hmm. And what I learned was the, the relationship between individuals and their social framework, whether that's an organization, a religious community. And what I discovered, and I did consulting with Fortune 500 companies, that's a whole other thing. But what I, what I discovered was an individual can only heal and transform as much as the social framework will allow. Mm. And mm -hmm. I also discovered that when a social framework organization of whatever type begins to grow, mm -hmm. it can also threaten individuals who have become comfortable with whatever the status quo is in their system. Mm. So mm -hmm. there's no... There's no insider versus outside. Right. It's all right. one. <laughs> it's all one. Yeah. To like, me, that, that's what's... Right. I remember when people used to argue about, do we create change from inside the system or outside the system? There is no outside. No, it's there is one. no, it's all one. And it's grounded in our consciousness. No system comes to be by itself. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. in, in Buddhism, we like to talk about there are causes and conditions that create things. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. one way to understand my book is I do a little bit of explanation of the causes and conditions that created our racialized consciousness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we don't understand what caused it, and what conditioned it, we can't uncause it, and we can't decondition it. So of the causes and conditions of racism, what is what, what are one or two of the things that you think that most Americans just don't get or, or don't realize as part of the causes and conditions of today's racism? Well, one thing is to, to uh, speak about trauma and what I mean by trauma is biological, the experience of being biologically destabilized in mm. your own nervous system. That is your sense of wellness has been lost. Your, your sense of wholeness, of completeness has been lost and you end up living a life full of reactivity in mm -hmm. which you are either fighting or fleeing or you become mm. numb. Mm -hmm. And so my critique of America in general is that we are numb. Mm. We are disassociated. Mm -hmm. We're so disconnected from our own bodies mm -hmm. that we literally cannot feel. Mm -hmm. It's like that Pink Floyd song, I have become comfortably <laughs> numb. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. And so that's one part of it. The second part is that the journey of race in America in particular, everyone has been traumatized, destabilized. Mm. As victims, that's easy. Well, for some of us, it's easy to see because we've had to live it. Mm -hmm. uh, but also witnesses have been traumatized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and perpetrators have been traumatized. Nobody escapes the destabilization of harm that we do to one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's an illusion about being a human being. I mean, what we now know about our mirror neurons and how our, how our brain gets shaped and our chemicals get released. I mean, what we now know about our body systems mm -hmm. for me is where we have to begin to unpack this. Mm. Got it. Yeah, I think that's one of the things I was really struck by, even though it is a short book, you cover so much ground, including colonialism, the history of racism, neuroplasticity, Buddhist concepts. 
But one of the concepts that I was really struck by, again, is to return to what we started with, of this idea of how karmic effects live in our nervous system. And I was really struck by this time in your book, you, you said, hearing the word race still sends shivers up my spine and makes my stomach tighten and my mind's defense mechanisms go on high alert. And I'm thinking about all those listening in on this call. And I imagine that, you know, even though they voluntarily came to, to listen to this conversation, that folks might be feeling different effects in their bodies and in their nervous system from, from hearing these things being talked about so directly. Um, and so I was wondering about if you could speak more to how, how do we deal with this energy that lives in our body? Right, whether we identify as, you know, a person of color who's been a target of racism, or if we, you know, are part of the legacy of uh, perpetrators, what do we do with that energy? Well, what what I'm doing with that energy is I decided to get myself uh, trained in trauma resilience work. Mm. So, uh, and of course, intuitively the African-American community and other people of color communities have done this through our rituals, through our songs, through our dances, through our poems. We, you know, I was, when I started studying trauma work and I started to realize why my mother danced at church, <laughs> she was releasing mm. trauma, coming back into balance. The stunt, the singing, the jazz, the gospel music, all of those are forms of working through trauma trying mm -hmm. to be stabilize your life enough your heart and mind enough to move forward without giving up mm -hmm. so i have and continue to study different teachings about uh, trauma and how to work with it in the body mm -hmm. um, peter levine one of the pioneers in somatic experiencing suggests that the world will not really be free until most of us learn how to self-regulate. Mm. Mm -hmm. That most mm -hmm. of us, so, you know, things still happen to me, right? It's like they mm -hmm. happen to you. I've watched the news. When I wrote this book, I told my wife almost every other day. I, didn't, I had no idea I had so many tears. I was mm. crying all the time, reprocessing, but I didn't know mm -hmm. how to reprocess. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm fortunate both through yeah. my mindfulness practices I know and through my trauma resiliency practices I know, I know how to handle my pain. Mm -hmm. I, know to, I know how to handle my energy that wants to run away or, mm -hmm. or my energy that wants to fight and hurt or my energy that wants me to just go numb and, and go into the dark. Mm -hmm. And so it is not just trauma, the event. Mm -hmm. It is the reactivity we have developed to cope with these events. Mm -hmm. And so we, we live in a society in which most of us are coping. Right. Reacting. And people may use alcohol or drugs right. or even just Facebook, right? Or anything. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> human beings. And I'm we out. Right. <laughs> well, anything mm -hmm. works for us to help us handle. Mm -hmm. um, our yeah. suffering that we may not know how to handle. So for me, education about what it means to be a traumatized, what trauma is from a biological point of view mm -hmm. is very important. And the skills to help our bodies come back, our minds come back into balance for me is one of the great uh, benefits of mindfulness practice. Mm -hmm. If we actually do it grounded in our body and not just think it's something we're thinking about. Sure. Yeah. So there's been a move um, in recent times to bring more trauma sensitivity to mindfulness practices mm -hmm. and the sort of argument that um, just sometimes a traditional meditation practices can actually reactivate trauma. That's correct. Or are not appropriate for everyone, depending on mm -hmm. what they're going through. Can mm -hmm. you speak more to that? Yes. One, one of the things that's different in our world than was not the same in the world of the Buddha or, or for thousands of years after him, people had individual relationships with teachers. 
Mm. So uh, people could, a, a student or a practitioner could come talk with you and say, I'm having difficulty with this. And you would give them a meditation or other exercises they could do to help them heal and transform themselves. Now, because we are in large groups, mm. so to speak, uh, individuals don't get the attention they need. Mm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's, I, that's part of the issue mm -hmm. um, uh, for me. Uh, the third thing, we need education on understanding how our brains work. I'm astounded <laughs> that, uh, you know, neuroplasticity is now a very popular word. New books are out. And my dissertation was on neuroplasticity and meditation. Um, but this is like 25, 30 years old. We just discovered uh, what was always going on, mm -hmm. which is that our brain cells, when we think about something, they talk and our thought is not an abstraction. We have neurons communicating. This is how thoughts happen. Language, our, our brain cells communicate, our behaviors, our brains, and whatever we communicate in our brains, the more often we do that action, the more habit is built. Mm -hmm. A neurological habit is built. Mm -hmm. And that habit can be both how we cope with things. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think it's important that we educate ourselves uh, as opposed to talking about what we believe. Mm. Mm -hmm. What do we know about our bodies? What is our experience? And for me, this is all the first foundation of mindfulness, which is the body. Mm -hmm. And I did a talk in Japan a couple of years ago. On, you know, in, in the Buddhist teachings on meditation, there's meditations on our skeleton. There's meditations on our breath. There's meditations on all of our organs. And so all I'm trying to say is, please, let's include our nervous system as an mm -hmm. object of meditation. Mm -hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, I really. Yeah. Yeah. The thing you said about that individual relationship and how when, you know, you go to a, medita a meditation retreat with 100 other people yeah. and, you know, you may not be given that guidance on how to deal with yeah. your own individual trauma. And I think that may be part of the reason that there's more of a dialogue happening now between Buddhism and psychotherapy and other yes. healing modalities. Right. Yes. Like, how do we how do we integrate all of these so yeah. that we can actually find that stability to get right. to those deeper states of meditation. Right. Right. And to me, the integration point is the body. Mm. There isn't anything else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> and so that has to be the place where the work right. is done. Yeah. It's also the place that is most racialized mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or sexualized in terms of your area of expertise. Right. It's like what people first put you in, you know, as soon as yeah. they see you, it's like, okay, what they, they try to figure out what your gender is and then right. it's your race. And then, yeah, there's yeah. a whole schema around that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. One of the other quotes I pulled out from your book was our bodies hold the retribution energies of America's racial karma. So I want to ask if you could speak more to your use of the term retribution. Okay. I know some people think of retribution as uh, vengeance mm -hmm. or final judgment is uh, language in the Christian tradition. You know, at the end of life, you will be judged. Uh, for me, retribution is present moment. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Karma is present moment. So it's, I think it's an, a mistake not to understand how powerful our human experiences are. Mm -hmm. And by retribution, living in the body, I mean fear. Mm -hmm. The fear I have when, you know, I, I spent the first 25 years of my life, literally my body would freeze when I saw a police car. Mm -hmm. I, I, the fear was just running through my veins. And over time, I, I had the uh, pleasure of working with a group of police officers in, in Miami. Mm. And uh, as a consultant, working on visioning work and things like that, mostly in 
organizational work, sometimes some diversity work. But what I realized is we've not been educated to be other than what we are. We have been educated to be separate, to live separate, not to be connected. Mm -hmm. We've been punished when we tried to get connected mm -hmm. uh, to one another, shamed mm -hmm. as we try to get connected. to one. This is in our bodies. And so my, my grandfather, who, who adopted my parents and therefore adopted me, but worked for the Pennsylvania Railroad for over 50 years. And I used to go to work sometimes with him at four in the morning on weekends, on Saturdays. Of course, Sunday we went four o'clock prayer meeting to church. But uh, he would tell me stories of being afraid every time a white person got on the car. He just felt it, and you know, no harm came to him, but just mm -hmm. the, the fact that it could, mm -hmm. and he that it could without consequence. Mm -hmm. without accountability is where the fear gets deeper. Mm -hmm. So my body knows the experience of my ancestors because they live in me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I didn't just appear. Right. <laughs> and then it's and, because of the ways these fear and traumas live in, in differently racialized bodies Right. right, that we see um, these ongoing problems with, you know, uh, police brutality and um, the over inc the incarceration of yes. uh, people of color. Um, and so you talked about, like, in your own life, um, recognizing that the way you needed to shift what was happening was through trauma resilience practices and uh, mindfulness. Um, when we come together in communities or in you know different systems, whether it be prison or the schools, how do we start to collectively shift to shift the collective body? Well, uh, for me, and you know, other people have written about this, especially recently. But to me, creating an environment of safety. Mm -hmm. We cannot heal if we don't feel safe. Mm -hmm. If we don't feel safe individually and if we don't feel safe together. Mm -hmm. So learning how to create safety together mm -hmm. in the presence of one another mm. is how we begin to shift this. Mm. But safety is not order. This is right. one of my critiques about uh, colonial, the colonial mind that still lives in America's soul uh, order is not harmony. Mm -hmm. Right. And we somehow have con condition ourselves to think that we have laws and then we have order to make sure people obey those laws. But what I'm trying to say in my experience, order turned out to be brutality. Mm, it's repression. Yes, it's subjugation, it's repression. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is not harmony. And mm -hmm. back to my Cleveland growing up, uh, you know, there were some problems and there was some, a small gang that emerged in high school, uh, but nothing too dangerous. <laughs> They're mm -hmm. mostly boys with nothing else to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I think learning how to create safe environments in which we live and work and interact is the foundation for healing our trauma. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, a friend of mine is a therapist and um, she comes from a Jewish heritage and um, she sh shared with me a paper recently on how important safety is in healing trauma. Mm. And the research concludes that there is no healing of trauma without the experience of safety coming first. Mm -hmm. so, so without that, safety, we can't acknowledge, we can't release mm -hmm. the parts of us that are in pain. 
And that makes me think of the Buddhist concept of the Sangha, right? Yes. Like the, the religious community and how, yes. how much that's like uh, Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King's beloved, beloved. community. Yes. Right? Like we need this community of practitioners who are together yes. practicing anti-racism and practicing yes. um, trauma release and practicing yes. how we learn how to self-regulate in community, right? Our, our nervous systems and heal our nervous oh, yeah. systems. And the next step beyond self-regulation is self-enhancement. Mm, we mm. also need not only to learn to regulate our nervous systems, but to enhance it mm -hmm. so that it becomes capable of sustaining a planetary life. Mm, right mm -hmm. now, our nervous systems are coded and trained and conditioned to be little selves mm -hmm. or cities or towns or states or nations but our nervous system is yet not grown mm -hmm. to be capable of holding the whole earth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for me, this is what the work is beyond self-regulation, beyond learning how to be calm and practice shamanta deeply. Uh, the other thing about shamanta, I, I think it's important to say is that shamanta practice when it is fully realized, for me, what is there is a state of equanimity mm -hmm. and evenness of mind. It doesn't mean you put up with anything. Mm -hmm. It does mean you're capable of holding your own suffering. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you're apathetic. No, it uh, doesn't yeah. mean you're apathetic. It means you're capable of being clear, mm -hmm. open-hearted, and holding your own suffering in a way that you can transform it mm. without mm -hmm. it leaking out on your kitchen table, on your son or your daughter or your partner or your neighbor. Mm -hmm. Equanimity is not uh, absence. Right. It is full presence of uh, wholeness. Yeah. So you're not, you're not contributing to the cycles of violence right. and the chaos and exactly. the dis disharmony. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So is that is that the work of the Lotus Institute? Can you speak a little bit more about what you and your partner do at the Lotus Institute? Well, our, our team at Lotus, um, well, I'll describe it this way. We've created, we do retreats, online retreats, live retreats. We teach around the world. We have a retreat, a virtual retreat coming up in Japan with uh, colleagues and students and friends we have there this coming Saturday, uh, for example. But what we do at Lotus, our theme mm -hmm. is whatever teachings we do, whatever spiritual practices we do, we want to do them deeply. We want to be non-superficial mm -hmm. in our work and in our practice. And then we want to go even deeper mm -hmm. so that we actually get a sense of what, what is this? Mm -hmm. What is underneath this? What is at the root of our suffering? What is at the root of our healing? And then deeper still is our third uh, category. This is embodying our own healing, mm -hmm. embodying our own transformation, which we don't actually have to talk about necessarily. We have to be present mm -hmm. with it, with our kindness, with our generosity, with our insight, with our fierce love, mm -hmm. with our demand for uh, I was asked by someone in Atlanta a few weeks ago about equality. And I said, you know, actually, I'm not interested in being equal. I'm not interested in being yeah. superior. Mm -hmm. I'm not interested in being less than. Mm -hmm. I am interested in being Larry. Mm. <laughs> I am. I'm, I'm interested in being a human being who has a precious life. Mm -hmm. And so we have designed an online course called the Earth Gate mm -hmm. at Lotus, which for us is the first stage of doing the resilience, trauma, mindfulness of the body work so that we get basic tools mm -hmm. to learn how to handle our traumatic experience, which is activated daily, of course. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then our next gate is called the wind gate, the one we're working on now to come out early next year. 
it's about decolonializing our minds. We have so many impressions and thought forms and values that we've inherited. But let's just take beauty. What the colonial tradition taught us about who's beautiful, what's beautiful, or let's take purpose of life. Uh, what we learned from the colonial period is it's about accomplishment and acquisition and acquiring. Is that so? Because my experience with people who've been very accomplished is they still suffer. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and I've had people one-on-one, -on -one, some very successful people tell me about their suffering, but they don't feel safe telling anybody else in their, outside of their field, outside of their constituents, outside of their comrades or whatever the case may be, people they work with, neighbors, friends, and family. This is difficult in a society that individualizes everything. Mm -hmm. So I don't wanna be a racist, I'm a good person, right? Uh, and without understanding the systemic nature of that thought. There, there's so much that I could like ask you to expound upon and everything you said, there's so many um, concepts, but the one that I wanna ask you to say a little bit more about is this concept of equality, right? Because this is a term in the Western liberal tradition, right? That women's rights, uh, civil rights, um, LGBTQ rights have all been used framed by this language of equality. Right. And you explain in your book that the Buddha actually said, not only should we not think of, we shouldn't get in this trap of thinking of ourselves as better, equal, or less than. And I think right. many people would say, yeah, of course we shouldn't think of ourselves as better or less than, but we shouldn't think of ourselves as equal then. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought that was very thought provoking. And if you could just elaborate on that in the context of, you know, our social justice language. Mm -hmm. Well, for me, you know, the, the language that we have now of justice is um, not that old. It's several hundred years old, came out of the Catholic Church. And so for me, our, our whole framework for justice is still a colonial model. Mm. Mm -hmm. It places me in a position of asking for something. You know, mm -hmm. Malcolm X talked about, Malcolm X talked about this, places me in a position for begging for my life. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, no, I don't want equality. I want genuineness. Mm -hmm. I want uh, respect, um, kindness, um, creativity. Mm -hmm. And so the reason I say what I say about equality is because each one of us is such a mystery. How could it be in some box? Because mm. it's like uh, trying to flatten us all as if yeah, we're all the same. Yeah, we're mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness we're not. I mean, what we're missing in one another is just profound to me. Mm -hmm. The talents and genius that has been pressed down mm -hmm. or cut off and so uh, equality, it depends on the context in which you refer to it. Mm -hmm. If you're referring to it as a political framework, in my view, you're mistaken. Mm -hmm. Because the current political framework doesn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. Right? If right. it did, we wouldn't be having these conversations. So to me, that's, we, we need a consciousness which is growing, mm -hmm. which is emerging, that can help us redefine what it means to be in relationship to one another. Mm -hmm. And um, for me, that's about harmony, that's about wellness. And by harmony, I don't mean there's no conflicts. Mm -hmm. I mean, we know how to handle our conflicts without hurting one another. So for me, this is why I go back to training and education applied, not sitting through a classroom where everybody sitting there goes, God, how soon can I get out of this? That's not training. Um, so for me, equality, 
spiritually, all of us are so absolutely full of mystery, depth, and greatness. How could how could how could that be equal? Mm -hmm. There's no way to measure that vastness yeah. that each human being is. Mm -hmm. So that's why I have say what I say about equality, even though it's based on the Buddhist concept of what Thich Nhat Hanh calls and other Buddhist traditions call uh, the okay. self self grandizement in some mm -hmm. ways the conceits yeah, yeah. the self conceit yeah. the self delusion mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i'm going to be chewing on this one for some time thank you good, good. <laughs> you know i let, i mean there's always new things to learn you know there's like sometimes there's just that one concept or that new term that you might have seen before, but it doesn't really hit you until someone explains mm -hmm. it in a new way. So I really want to thank you for that. Sure. And um, it looks like we only have a few minutes left. So okay. Um, I am going to ask you uh, in a moment to uh, to read some of your poetry. Before I do that, I want to say, um, you know, for folks who are listening and who are reflecting on all the traumas and stressors that people are under, be it um, COVID and the elections and the ongoing police brutality and institutionalized racism, which you know we know has been going on for, for a long, long time. Right. But some folks, particularly white folks, are just now uh, beginning to have it more in their consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, oh. Is there a message that you want people to walk away with as they think about, you know, how do I become part of creating a world of more harmony rather than uh, perpetuating these systems? Well, first, and by harmony, I, I don't mean some exotic state of abstract peacefulness. Mm -hmm. By harmony, I mean the living presence of the processes that keep us alive, that keep us caring for one another, that allow us to grow and allows our planet to recover mm -hmm. from what we've done to it. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> that's that. I think the core practices of mindfulness still play a very important role here. Uh, every day I try to keep in touch with my feet as I walk mm -hmm. and touch the earth so I don't forget where I am. <laughs> I don't forget where I live. It's so easy. We're so in our heads that coming back to our bodies, we've been conditioned not to be in our bodies in America. We've been conditioned to live from the neck up. And so this is one of the dilemmas we have around race. If you are not in your body, you can't feel somebody else's suffering. You can't identify with someone else's pain. And what I've learned is when I can identify with someone else's pain, I am accessing my own pain. I'm learning how to handle my own pain without being a victim to it. But if we go along as we have, and you know, it's easy in this society for many of us to pretend because we're going through the motions of our lives, we're doing okay, we're not particularly suffering. But that's because we don't know how to think of ourselves as collective. Mm -hmm. We think we do by calling ourselves a nation, America. We still don't know how to be together. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason is we have been trained not to be together. Mm -hmm. That's what segregation was all about. Mm -hmm. That's what the prison system is. I mean, it's just. And, and the focus on wealth building as the only meaning of being human is, is at the core of this ugliness. Mm -hmm. If we go back to the doctrine of discovery, the 15th century, we will see the conquistadors and the soldiers that went out, went out for wealth and power with the church's permission, both the Catholic church and the Protestant church. And so we, we're having to unpack this heritage because it's in us. 
I had a conversation with my father one day at the kitchen table and uh, I had a friend come by and he didn't like her hair. And he said to me, he didn't like her hair. Why don't you say something to her about her hair? And I said, are you crazy? You don't tell other people how to be themselves. Mm -hmm. Her hair is like my hair, if I had any, is my business. <laughs> <laughs> and but this is this is legacies we have this but i'm talking about the patriarchy you know because mm -hmm. the white supremacy model is based on the ladder of racial skin tones and superiority down to inferiority that's one piece the hierarchy of value based on skin tone another piece is patriarchy and the other piece is extraction of wealth mm -hmm. So these three things come together that keep the system of white supremacy in place. Mm -hmm. But again, this didn't come from nowhere. People mm -hmm. created it. Mm -hmm. And so for me, once we understand what we create, we can uncreate it. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. we have the courage and are willing to do the work yeah. and retrain ourselves so we can. So what, I, what I'm hearing you say is that um, one of the things that folks may need to, to really think about in order to dismantle racism is to work on unnumbing ourselves. I think that's, in America, I think that's fundamental. Mm -hmm. Fundamental. Mm -hmm. I, I can't tell you how many people I have met who can't feel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you don't want to feel if you're not in a safe environment. Right. Right. Yeah which is part of our political catastrophe. Mm -hmm. At this moment, we keep trying to communicate to ourselves how unsafe we are, mm -hmm. which- right. um, Perpetuates it. Perpetuates it. Yeah. You know, in a moment, we're gonna go to Q&A and I know folks have some questions about, specifically about that, but um, as a segue, I wanna share that I think one of the ways in which we can also access um, our bodily experience and something beneath that numbness is through the arts, is yes. through dance and poetry and ritual. And, you know, um, as soon as I talked with you the other day, I said, you know, what really struck me from your book that initially was the poetry that you shared. So I was wondering as a gift to our audience, if you would mind sharing one of your poems with us as a way of closing. Okay. Uh, yes, to follow up on your comment, we cannot think ourselves through this. Mm. We have to feel our way through this. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, let's see, I think I have one here. The morning mist hides the mountain's majesty, but the mountain is still there. It comes and goes nowhere. I too remain solid and unafraid. Fierce winds rage in the mind streams of those caught in the suffering of extremes. Our mindful energies echo sounds of kindness and sincerity in the air, offering fresh balance, soulful depths, and the energy of new sanity. I hear the sacred gate opening, revealing the middle way, always present, silent now, all is still, rising feminine within and without now. Thank you. That was sure. beautiful. Do you have Thanks. plans to publish a book of poetry next? Uh, I do. Yeah, I have some of my friends and students have been collecting poems from retreats and other things over the years. And so, yes, um, they put together a collection I have 
once this once all this is over with <laughs> I'll, I'll sit with and then do final edits and etc yeah I, I I a great quote i heard about this and it's not so much about my poetry but any poetry is i don't know who the author was but it was our something like our societies would be much better off if we listen to our poets mm. instead of our politicians <laughs> What an idea. What an idea. <laughs> Maybe we can all try that for a week. Yeah. Think, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> listen yes. to the poets. <laughs> so I, li I, I listen, I read poetry all mm -hmm. the time. I study mm -hmm. every morning myself mm -hmm. on my own as I meditate. Mm -hmm. Of course, I keep academically connected to what people are writing mm -hmm. uh, across disciplines. Because it's the other thing I think is so important that we learn how to think beyond one discipline. Mm -hmm which Absolutely. I know you do. Absolutely, thank you. Sure. Uh, I believe we have some questions coming in here. Um, someone asked, if you're open, uh, this is from Emily, if you're open to sharing, what specific trauma resiliency practices have you found yourself engaging in and how have they been helpful what would you recommend as a first step or entry point for traumatized BIPOC, that means Black Indigenous people mm -hmm. of color, mm -hmm. wanting to begin trauma resiliency work? Well, my path along those lines has been to get myself educated, to understand my own body systems, mm -hmm. understand my nervous system, uh, my sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems and how they work, how they get activated, how I get triggered. Um, so to me, the first step is getting educated and there are several uh, trauma resource groups that offer training and certification. But I, I, for me, it's about learning about my own body. You know, it was only when I was doing that training that I realized how my ancestors process trauma mm. when I thought they were doing something else. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, so, and, and so then I said, oh, that's why my mother danced like that on Sunday. Mm. Oh, it just that's having a good time. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't just having a good time. She was shaking off. I mean, once mm. you start to, so one of the things you can do and is I have 10 particular exercises in the book um that are immediately effective in helping you stabilize your nervous system and uh, these exercises are from the trauma resource institute where i have studied and worked with teams and we work in haiti and in china with earthquake and all kinds of traumas uh, uh, but also with individuals and and their work and i think what's what's important is to get yourself trained so you be, feel comfortable and confident mm -hmm. in handling what comes up in your body. Mm -hmm. and of course, you will discover things. I still discover things I didn't know I was carrying from my ancestors. But as those things and things that are unhelpful or painful or dehabilitating that I'm carrying, but I know how to recognize those things and I know what to do immediately when one of them comes up. So one of my basic practices I do every morning before I get out of bed. And it's actually a meditation uh, from Buddhism called the five remembrances. So when I wake up in the morning, before I get out of bed, I open my eyes. And of course I'm shocked that <laughs> I'm awake. But then I, I focus in on my breathing two inches below my navel, not, not up here, down below my navel. Because when we focus our attention on the breath, the respiration at this level, it starts to stabilize our nervous system immediately. So I keep my focus of attention there as I breathe and I repeat a mantra to myself. And the first mantra is, I am of a nature to grow old. I can't escape growing old. The second one is I'm of a nature to get sick. Mm. 
I can't escape being vulnerable physically or mentally. The third one is I am of a nature to die. I cannot escape death. The fourth one is everything I love and everything I cherish is of a nature to change. I cannot escape being separated or discomfort when mm. change happens. And the fifth one is I am the author of my life. I cannot escape what I've authored. <laughs> I cannot escape what I've created. And how this helped, and I've done this for years, and over time, it went from deep, deeper to deeper still. And so as I did this practice over time, I realized everything on the earth is, every species goes through this experience. Mm. And when I see our dog who's 17 years old, Charlie, aging, and I, I look at him and I get, I, I turn to my wife, Peg, and I go, oh, Charlie's getting old. And I realize I'm talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what the practice this does for me is it breaks down the self object barrier. Mm. So when I put my feet on the floor, you know, to do walking meditation, to go do sitting meditation, I am, I have a sense of being connected to all of life. And so it gets me beyond the small I. And I think part of our dilemma with dealing with our trauma, our instability, whether that's individual, collective, because it's all meshed, uh, is we, we, we are in an exit, we are afraid to be human. Um, that's one exercise I do. And there's nine other ones in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a list of things. If you get activated during this call, stop, go drink some water. Stopping and changing your activity also helps to reset your nervous system. You can also take a walk, which I do all the time in the garden, on the street, and pay a strict attention to the sensations of your feet touching the earth. Mm -hmm. And after you begin this in a non-superficial way, then you can start to turn your attention to all the earth that's around you. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite practices I do every day is I listen to the sounds of the world. Mm -hmm. I get up, when I get up, I go outside and I sit in silence and just listen. And Beautiful. I, I just listen. I don't try to evaluate anything. A good practice is, is to not name everything you hear. Because mm. uh, what I've discovered is when I name things, I, I have already removed myself from being connected. Mm. Um, you can go press against a wall or a tree or a rock and stay there for a few minutes and it will reset your nervous system. It'll bring it back into balance. It'll mm -hmm. help you calm down, help you become more stable. So these aren't gigantic, these are little things that we have to learn how to do. And then as we learn how to do this together, we can really go somewhere. Mm -hmm. We can actually have fun healing <laughs> and transforming ourselves, but not without the skills to handle our pain our grief, our fear, our reactivity. So the Trauma Resource Institute is a great resource to check and it's referenced in the book. Another person who I, I study with also is a woman named Irene Leon from Vancouver. Irene Lyon, who's also a trauma expert and has a different approach, uh, a good approach, very practical also. And she's very educational focused. So for me, that's where I think we have to begin. And uh, otherwise, our bodies, the reason I, re I got here, two stories. I, got, I know I only have a minute. One is <laughs> okay. in, in the 1960s and early 70s, I was living and working on the west side of Chicago. I moved to Chicago after the riots. 
on the west side to help rebuild the west side of Chicago. Mm -hmm. And my organization, Ecumenical Institute, that I was a staff member of, we created a course called White, Race, White Racism in African American History. And we brought black people and white people together in a seminar more than once. And what I realized is that none of us could get past our pain. Mm. Whether that's the pain I pretend I don't have, and that's painful, <laughs> or the pain I do have that I wish I didn't have, which is also painful, that we, we could not create the safety we needed to heal. So we must learn how to create safety in ourselves and between one another and among one another. Mm -hmm. But it has to, our inner work is not for nothing. It's, I think it's such a positive trend that there's more trauma awareness coming yes. into mindfulness communities, different social yes. justice communities. Yes. Um, I think it's so important. And that segues into a question from Paula, which is how do you define safety for a community since individuals have such different thresholds of perceived safety? My trauma may make me feel unsafe in what quote should be a safe environment. Well, I think there's several levels uh, to this question. One is when I first, for example, when I first started uh, practicing in the Buddhist community, and I was the only African American there, mm. uh, it wasn't that I felt unsafe. It was the outsider experience. Um, and so it's important to recognize what, what you mean by unsafe. Mm. You know, sit down and write down for yourself what you mean by unsafe. How do you know you feel unsafe? What are the signs that you, you don't feel safe as, as an individual? And then I think it's important to acknowledge not everybody's ready for group stuff. I can take a journey and take time. Uh, you know, it depends on whether you're introverted, extroverted. I mean, all these things factor in. I don't. My bottom line is I don't go anywhere or hang out with people where I don't feel safe. Mm. I've upset many people over the years who wanted to be my friend. And I said, well, thanks, but no thanks. <laughs> and, and so part of this is figuring out who you hang out with mm -hmm. and whose voices you listen to. Mm -hmm. And uh, how often do you listen to those voices in your head and outside? How much attention mm -hmm. do, do you give? to what makes mm. you feel unsafe. Because mm. what we know in the brain is the attention we give things grows things. Mm. So I would do a personal inventory and look at my own journey with safety. I'm sure this goes back to earlier childhood, uh, which I know about as, as someone who was abandoned and then adopted. So for years I had I struggled with the feeling of abandonment. And so I didn't want to engage with anybody because I thought, well, then I'll just get left by the wayside. Mm -hmm. So really looking at your own spiritual, your own journey, not as judgment, but for discernment. Mm -hmm. You know, we all have journeys mm -hmm. and they're all a mess. Mm -hmm. And that, <laughs> that mess is the, is the, the, the way I like to say it is, if you don't have a mess, and you're a cook, you got nothing to cook with. You got no ingredients. So for me, Buddhist practice and spiritual practice in whatever the form is, is so that we learn how to turn our, our messes into beauty. Mm -hmm. And then you need to just find one friend that is safe to be with. Start there, but don't burn that person out. So maybe it's tea once a week, maybe it's coffee, maybe it's a walk, but figure out simple things you can do with another person or a pet or a tree or a garden or hummingbirds, which has been one of my recent uh, gathering of friends uh, where I lived and, and find something that gives you that sense of being safe. Mm -hmm. And then you can add to it. 
but mm -hmm. I didn't start out feeling safe. Mm -hmm. I started mm -hmm. out feeling abandoned. Mm -hmm. But it took personal work and the kindness of other people who were willing to help me have the experience of safety, the experience of being recognized, of being heard, of being listened to. And so this for me is where it starts. And if you're in a community that cannot listen, you will not feel safe. Mm -hmm. I will not feel safe. That's why the practice of listening to one another is really fundamental in healing and transforming our racialized existence. That's so profound what you shared, your own journey from you know, not wanting to engage and having that abandonment trauma to, to being able to speak so openly to large groups of people about uh, trauma healing practices and racialized healing. And, and, you know, I think what you've said speaks to another question that came up, which was that mindfulness is often passed off as individualist, but how have you witnessed it as a collective tool? And it, it seems like you've, um, You've addressed that, but it's, is there anything more you want to say? To yes, that? and and for me, mindfulness is Thich Nhat Hanh often says mindfulness is a kind of energy. Mm -hmm. It's not a technique. There are practices that can cultivate that energy, mm -hmm. uh, but don't confuse the practice with the without the energy. Mm. That's like having a form with no substance. So I've met people who say, well, I'm a mindfulness practitioner. And so I say mindful of what? No, uh, I've learned from, from Thich Nhat Hanh and Buddhism, the mind is always mindful of something. So the question is, what direction do I put my attention? And if that attention does not help me heal, then I change my, it's like changing the channel on the TV. Um, I had some friends last week who wanted to know if I was going to watch the debate. I said, no, because I knew if I did two minutes into it, I'd be dealing with my own fury. So why would I put that on myself? I'm already furious. I don't, <laughs> I, <laughs> right. I don't need more. Yeah. I need, I need to learn how to take that fury and put it into action. Mm -hmm. that heals and creates beloved community. I think we may be the two, only two people, at least that I know, that didn't watch the debate because I had a similar <laughs> response. <laughs> um, I think we have a few minutes left. There's someone who asked, how can we begin convincing oppressive people to start engaging in their own trauma healing? And I'll, I'll share for a moment my sense of this, and then I'd love to hear what you have to say, is that, you know, I think people are only ready to engage in their own trauma healing when they're aware that when they, the suffering gets to a certain point, right? And um, folks who are, may seem in positions of power, as you have mentioned, or have privilege or status, have their own suffering, but often don't recognize how their suffering is actually connected to the suffering of those that they hold power over. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I'm sure you, you have some, thoughts about that as well. Well, well in, in line with what you're saying, many people don't know they are suffering. Mm -hmm. That's a part of the dilemma is I'm fine, right? So I don't have any issues. So mm -hmm. why does somebody else have issues? This for me is connected again to our trance of individualism. Mm where we can only perceive or accept or understand things from a personal perspective. So, you know, America has been very successful at convincing us we're alone as individuals. And um, th this is one of our greatest, I had a friend who was, who she was a nun and she was being transferred to a monastery in the United States and she said, well, what is it like in the United States? I've never been to the United States. Well, I said, well, sister, you have to be prepared to be alone. Mm. And uh, I got a note back from her. She visited San Francisco. She said, oh, what are all these people doing sleeping on the streets? This is America. 
this is some people's America. Mm. So as long as we pretend that everything's okay, we silently will go down with the ship. Mm. That's how I see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, you know, coming to terms with our own pain individually is already difficult, but we have not been trained. No, we, we've been rewarded not to mm -hmm. in this culture. Yeah. You know, and this is also back to the patriarchy, puffing ourselves up, which we can see, um, pretending nothing's wrong. If you complain, something's wrong with you. You're not measuring up all these colonial impressions on what it means to be a human being, which is fundamentally male, is uh, part of the core of what we must heal in ourselves. Mm -hmm. So one, one, 25 years ago, I decided I had studied enough with men. So I spent the next 15 years studying with female teachers on purpose. It was, so my, very, it was a very wise choice. <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of an experience when I was uh, in college and going through uh, my women's studies program mm -hmm. and I had a period of time where I only read female authors. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I started to incorporate some men and, um, but still read a lot of women and, and it does shift your perspective on the world. You know, it, you realize um, how male dominated most yeah. disciplines are. Yeah. Yeah. it's and it it uh you know my, my much of my study i studied shamanism in africa uh with uh both men and women i studied shamanism in here in the u.s with native indigenous peoples who kindly offered that training which i continue to do but so one of the things you need to do if you're interested in in trauma is also go back to your root traditions your mm. cultural traditions our ancestors did not survive by thinking about things like we think about they survived by creating experiences ritual song art poetry and dance to handle grief mm. this is the last thing i think in america is, is like if there was some way to have a collective hospice uh, a friend of mine said, this is what we need right now. We, have, we are underwater in grief. Mm -hmm. But when we look at what we see in the media, you would not know we're grieving people. Mm -hmm. We're grieving loss. Mm -hmm. We're grieving the disappointment of what we thought was going to be this not. Yeah. We're grieving the planet. Oh my God. I mean, every time I Anyway, it's, 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 so we have a huge amount of grief work to do, which most of us are not skilled at, but our ancestors knew a lot. So look back at your own cultural roots. Look at other cultural practices of how the genius of humanity has gotten us this far in evolution. The idea that we're so smart, I find humorous <laughs> and not in an especially good way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you referenced the debates uh, a couple minutes ago, and that sort of segues into this last question from Leslie, which is, do you see a difference between political hope and spiritual hope? Yes. Um, to, 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 to use that language, for me, spiritual hope has no beginning and no end. Political hope is always confined and always temporal. In Buddhism, we talk about in one level of the two truths, the truth of the relative or the historical, the everyday, the ordinary. And we talk about the ultimate truth, the absolute truth, the truth of the cosmos present and to me the work is to merge these truths mm -hmm. so when when i am working in the garden uh with my weeping cherry tree 
I am tending to the soul of the earth. It is not just the tree. It is that tree. I mean, it's so as learning, and once we get in our bodies, we can start to experience these connections in everyday life. And that changes our perception of the world, of other people, and what's possible. So, yes, there's a big difference for me mm -hmm. between political yeah. hope and spiritual hope. I so appreciate that because, you know, I was recently, I have my hopes about how this election will go. And I, I told myself, I said, okay, you know, if you, if you get really caught up in this, you're just inviting put much potential suffering. Mm -hmm. You know, if you start to get caught up in what happens or attaching to an yeah. outcome. You know, whereas spiritual hope, it, it's, to me at least, it feels more like the recognition of my own you may call it Buddha nature, right? Yes. And my own capacity right. to Your grow spiritually. To grow spiritually. And, and yeah. for me, that means kind of bringing these two, that means Rick, the third journey we're working on in Lotus beyond the deconditioning our colonial mind. The third one is we're calling the thunder gate. It's the gate of release. Most of us mm -hmm. don't know what it's like to be well. Mm. We live in a pathologically described world. Everything is either broken or <laughs> about to break or something's wrong. We have no cl many clues of what it's like to be well with one another on our own. And so we, we're calling that the thunder gate of release of energy. Um, and then the last gate we have uh, that we're developing um is the gate of embodiment uh it's the dragon gate and we use the dragon because the dragon mythically especially in asia has so many parts so many characteristics all available at once and so we need to step into our evolutionary self mm. or we're not going to make it out of this mm -hmm. We need to pick up the path of imagination. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I had a meeting with a group of school teachers last week and owners of a school in Bangkok and, and where I'm on the board. And my, my question to them was, okay, well, when you meet with parents, ask them what kind of school they want for their children. And they did that. And they reported uh, back to me on Monday what they heard back from their thousand parents uh, or so 500 parents or so what they wanted for their children. And it was amazing. Teamwork, empathy, respect, and you know, also competence. But competence was among empathy, respect, caring, kindness was on their list. So that's not the list I, you know, I grew up with that list from my parents. Um, and so nourishing and developing this part of ourselves, mm -hmm. which is already inherent capacity, as we say in Buddhism, Buddha nature is there, but not if we don't recognize it and, uh, support it, its growth and its embodiment in our daily life. Mm -hmm. Wow. Thank you. Sure. Uh, you, Dr. You. Ward, it's been such an honor to speak with you, and I've given me so much to to chew on and contemplate. And I know I'm going to be digesting these ideas for a long time, as most me of too. our listeners will be <laughs> as well. So. Continuous learning. <laughs> yes. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure, um, and thank you to our audience. And I want to turn it over now to Alex of Public Programs. Thank you all so much for attending today. We hope you will join us for more of our upcoming talks and workshops. This conversation was recorded, so if you would like to watch it again or share it with your community, it will be available on our YouTube channel at this same link and later on our Facebook page. We will also feature this talk on our podcast, which you can find at www.ciispod.com or by searching CIIS Public Programs on your favorite podcast app. Thanks again for joining us and have a wonderful evening. Mm -hmm.